Well, hello and welcome to today's interview. I am Nick Cooper, the General Secretary of the Asia Pacific Grains Federation. I'm very pleased to be joined today by the Honourable Richard Masere MP. Richard was first elected to the Papua New Guinea Parliament in 2017, representing Ijivitari as a member of the National Alliance Party. And in 2020, he was appointed the Vice Minister, assisting the Prime Minister on foreign investment matters. In early 2021, Mr. Masere resigned from the Our Development Party and joined the Papua New Guinea Greens, marking the first but not the last time that Greens are represented in the PNG Parliament. At this July's election, Richard was overwhelmingly re-elected in the new seat of Popandetta. This is the first time a Greens Party member has been elected to the PNG Parliament. Richard, thank you so much for joining me and congratulations. How are you feeling? Yeah, thank you, Nick. Uh, firstly, I uh, appreciate uh, uh, the support that uh, I've received from uh, PNG Greens Party. Uh, I was approached in um, 2019, and obviously uh, it was a process that we worked very closely with the PNG Party um, uh, Greens um, General Secretary, uh, Mr. Andrew Kutapai, where uh, the discussions were on having a, a parliamentary voice to represent uh, people specifically on issues that uh, are global issues, but more so affecting developing countries like Papua New Guinea which is climate change and the fact that uh, there was a lot of industrialization taking place within the country where um, uh, we felt or they felt that uh, there need to be a voice to be able to challenge some of these uh, development changes that were taking place, which were affecting our forests, faunas, affecting our oceans, affecting our land, affecting our people, affecting our culture. And, uh, and they felt that they, were, they needed to be a voice at the parliamentary level. And uh, obviously, um, uh, having a look at the history of PNG Greens, they've tried on many occasions in many elections to have a representative on the floor of parliament. But obviously, PNG politics is quite different than I believe in, in the other parts of the world where people vote on party policies. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, elections are really uh, focused around individuals, more so than well, on parties. So obviously, uh, I felt that there needed to be a voice uh, in Parliament. So that gave me the the opportunity and also uh, the challenge to be able to take on a party that was firstly um, did not have any political representation for years since it, since its uh, inception in two thousand and one, uh, and and I felt that maybe this might be an opportunity for me to speak for our simple people, basically in Papua New Guinea. And um, if you understand, and you would appreciate that Papua New Guinea, uh, about 90% of our people are rural based. And many of these people are not exposed to the uh, global um, challenges, like uh, there's not enough awareness, there's not enough information out there for them to understand the effects of climate change in, in, uh, in Papua New Guinea and also around the world. So for them, uh, 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 because of their uh, uh, lack of understanding, it also gave me that challenge to be able to be their voice on the floor of parliament. So obviously, uh, that synergy started in 2019, and obviously, uh, we I signed up in 2020. And then obviously, the next step was to um, prepare for the 2022 national general election. Uh, and that meant by uh, putting in place a, 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 uh, a team that would work around the clock to try and raise some money for the elections, uh, which uh, we had a fundraising dinner uh, in December of 2021. And we raised a little bit of money from that fundraising, which then gave us an opportunity to endorse a few candidates in, a, in specific seats around the country. Um, obviously, elections are quite costly and quite expensive. So we did our part to support some candidates, but obviously, um, uh, like I said, the lack of knowledge, uh, lack of information, lack of awareness of people, what Greens Party really stood for, I think um, uh, did not get the the result that we wanted. But I think uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, as it's slowly uh, maturing, uh, and the, the younger generations that are coming up, I believe PNG Greens Party uh, offers that opportunity to younger people to maybe participate or join the party, and they can be our voice um, uh, at the community level, at the domestic level, 
and slowly we can build a party going forward. And I think that's going to be the approach, whether it be me or whether it be Andrew Kutapai, the general secretary of the party, or whether it be the next generations of Papua New Guinea that come on board and take lead of this party, at least we can set some platforms and some foundations for them to build up from there. And then obviously, uh, uh, take Green's party to the next level, but uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a pleasure to be part of this international community that's focused on um, issues that are affecting the planet, and, uh, and 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 I hope that over the next uh, few years I can contribute uh, meaningfully to discussions and of course uh, participate meaningfully with other Greens party uh, parliamentaries around the world, and hopefully we can find a a peaceful. Uh, uh, resolution for the if effects of climate change that are affecting not just PNG but affecting the entire world. Well, it's very exciting to have you and Andrew leading the party there, and uh, we're very excited to see what you can achieve over the next five years and into the future. For those of us outside PNG, can you paint a picture of what an election campaign looks like there? Um, you mentioned uh, that election campaigns in PNG look quite different to the way that they do in many other uh, countries around the world. And I remember I saw news articles and photos describing big street parades and live music and lots of colour and energy, which is well very different to what it looks like in other parts of the world. How does an election campaign feel? What does it look like in PNG? Well, election campaign varies from province to province, district to district. So it all comes down to uh, the general um, cultural surrounding that uh, embraces the uh, people in those communities. So all elections are generally very different, but uh, the outcomes are generally the, pretty much the same. Where if you want to be a member of parliament, obviously you you've got to show that you know, those um, involving culture groups and carried in around your uh, when you're campaigning is is more as showing to the rest of the communities that one you're organized, uh, two you're prepared for this election, uh, three uh, it's also uh, the force that's with you uh, influences votes as well. So if you if you move around with uh, say uh, 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 say ten trucks with people, then the communities you're visiting can see your strength. So they will feel that they want to be part of that uh, success. So they they obviously resonate towards that kind of uh, appearance. Uh, whereas if you walk uh, in on your own into a community, uh, you know, on foot and expecting people to vote you, then obviously people will have a different perception of the way they see you is that maybe this fellow is not ready, maybe he's here uh, to entice us, he's got different motives, he's not prepared, there's no community support, there's no families behind him, so therefore he's moving uh, uh, on his own. Uh, but uh, if you if you show that you, you have a strong support base, generally it tends to attract uh, a voting population. So uh, parading is one part of a bigger, bigger picture that happens. Uh, it's 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 all about trying to um, uh, get the uh, westernized world of campaign, and then you also get the, um, the the village style of campaign, and you try to synergize it and try and create this uh, uh, an appearance that uh, attracts people to to see uh, uh, the type of person that they're going to vote for. But also, it's important that when you are campaigning, that uh, you maintain a consistency in what you are saying. So for us, when we were campaigning in 2017, obviously as a new candidate, uh, we had to give people a hope that if they choose us, then these are what we can do for them. In 2022, it was a slightly different campaign strategy because now we are a sitting member. So when we are going there, we are telling people, look, this is what we said in 2017. This is what we've delivered based on those platforms that we uh, campaigned on in 2017. And uh, and this is the strength we've now got with the learnings we've gained, with the projects we've delivered, with what we've got, the knowledge we've developed over the last five years. This is what we are willing and prepared to do for the next five years. So uh, those are important elements also when you are campaigning. So I don't think it's any different, uh, Nick. It's, it's just the way we go about doing it, because I think you've got culture on the other hand, and you've got the Western influence on the other hand. And we try to bring that together and create that atmosphere that attracts the attention of our, our voters. 
And uh, but again, in Papua New Guinea, it's a very costly exercise when it comes to election because it's really not about the party. Uh, most elections are influenced by individuals. So if, if people see me and they go, "Oh yeah, uh, Honourable Richard Mosseri, he, he's a he's a he's a he's a leader that's transparent, accountable." He's um, he's 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 open. He, he's what he delivers. What he says he will do. Uh, these are some attributes that attracts voters. So, uh, and when we campaign, it's like people relate very quickly to what we've done for them. So, in the last five years, we've uh, uh, our development plan was to change a community, because I I, I believe strongly that if you can change a village, uh, at uh, one step at a time, you can eventually change a nation. So that's always been our target. So we've targeted the basic needs of people like they wanted, because um, generally 90% of our people are, are subsistent farmers or fishermen. So um, to earn a living is very difficult for them. Uh, so we try to provide a platform for them like, okay, you can't afford to buy basic roofing for your house. So as a government, we will provide this for you in the next five years. So over a five year period, we've delivered to about 4,000 homes. Uh, Rufi nine solars for every uh, domestic solars for every home, so that's changed the the living standards of our people, and people are resonated or attracted by those simple changes that happens at the village level. So as you slowly change a village, you can over time change a nation. You know, so it's like if you plant a, a tree, over time you'll have a forest. <laughs> uh, Nick, so that's sort of the simple approaches that we we do one small thing at a time. It's like a hundred pieces of puzzle. You know, you put that together, and uh, over over a period, you can see the picture begin to show as you put all the puzzles together. So that's been our basic approach, uh, Nick, is to do simple things, smaller things, uh, engage with our community, and because we've been able to do that, uh, that captured the attention of our voters. And of course, as a city member, you expected that when you go in there, you're going with a bang and a noise, so that people say, "Yep." That's the guy we know, <laughs> kind of thing. So it's it's no different. Uh, uh, and uh, Nick, I, I think it's just the culture that makes it uh, slightly different from what happens around the rest of the world during the campaign. Mm. Any particular highlights stand out in your mind? Yeah, um, one particular uh, highlight that really stands out for me was, um, um, uh, you know, like when we are campaigning, we we do certain areas. Uh, you know, for a few days, and then we move to the next area. So uh, we progressively address or uh, visit all the villages that we can, that we set out in our, our campaign um, uh, plan. So um, I was traveling to one of these uh, villages along the main highway uh, towards the coastal community. And um, and as I was driving past, uh, some of the children ran on the road and they were chanting another candidate's name. Uh, and then one kid uh, ran out and started calling out uh, Masere. Ma you know, that's my surname. So he was he was chanting Masere, Masere. So um, we stopped the vehicle. Uh, we got out of the vehicle. We called that kid over, and um, and I gave him a packet of twisties. <laughs> and then we said, you know, thank you for supporting. You know, go convince your parents to vote for me. We got in the car and then we drove down to the coast. And obviously, after campaign, we drove back home. And then, of, of course, we drove past this this particular village, same village again. And as we were driving past, this time there was about three or four kids uh, <laughs> chanting Masere. So we stopped and gave those three or four kids uh, a packet of twisties. And uh, and then the next day we drove back down. This time half the kids were chanting my name, Masere, Masere. So we stopped, gave all those kids a packet of twisties, and then continued down. And then when we came back in the afternoon, all the kids... <laughs> Uh, we're chanting my my name, so we've convinced from one kid to the entire village children all just uh, chanting Masere Masere. So we stopped and gave every one of them a packet of twisties, and you know, so that was sort of for me that was like a uh, a, a, a standout in our campaign is that the children were involved in this campaign. You know, um, they were convincing their parents, and stories we had from those surrounding villages were that the parents were going to elect or they were going to. Uh, they had their own candidates and they were going to vote for their own candidates, but they kept hearing the kids sitting and having meal and dinner and, you know, talking about, oh, Masere, Masere gave us twisties. So the parents felt obliged in some way <laughs> to kind of say, okay, we'll give you a candidate number one because you guys are chanting his name. So sort of kids are beginning to influence, you know, and it, it, for me, that was just a, a standout for me in the election that, uh, you know, the kids um, uh, can influence. Their parents, oh, children particularly when their future. 
Yeah, like be particularly when we when our focus in the, yeah exactly, especially particularly in these five years where we're going to be focused on education. We, in the last five years, mm -hmm. we fo were focused on um, um, improving the quality of health. These next five years, we're going to be focused on improving the quality of education. So, of course, as they are chanting, I, I believe you know um, uh, divinely, you know there was some intervention in some way or form. Of course, the twisties packet did work. Um, but they were, uh, you could see the kids getting involved in this particular thing. And I'm, I'm proud, you know, the kids can see that there is a leader that has an interest in their future. So it, for me, that was a standout, uh, Nick, uh, as part of our campaign in 2022. That, that stood out for me. Well, this brings me to my next question. The past three years have obviously created huge challenges around the world. Um, and though many of the, the challenges are similar across uh, different countries, they obviously affect different communities differently. So what are the big issues facing Papua New Guinea today and the communities that you represent? Uh, uh... Uh, Nick, the, the, the global climate crisis must take uh, responsibility for what they're doing to, to, to the, the, the global climate. Smaller nations or developing nations uh, must you know, not do this or must not do that at the expense of what they're doing is wrong, completely wrong. Um, I think uh, as a developing nation, I think uh, developed nations must stop telling us um, uh, what uh, we must do. Uh, they should be asking us to tell them what they should do. I think there needs to be a complete overhaul of what the expectations are, is that developed nations cannot keep telling us, developing nations, um, uh, what uh, their expectations are of us, is that, but they should be asking us what our expectations are of them. And uh, un until developed nations... Uh, begin to understand that they are the ones contributing to the uh, climate uh, crisis that's affecting the world today, is that as long as they understand that and they start working with us and asking us what do we want more from them, and I think that once we change that uh, entire belief and entire approach, I think you will see that when we start, our voice starts taking a foot in the discussions of what's happening with climate change and the uh, the impact of climate change that is affecting the world, I think then we will see a, um, a gradual change in the way developed nations approach uh, the issue concerning climate change. Uh, for me, uh, um, uh, for my culture is that uh, it's the lack of knowledge, uh, lack of awareness in our rural communities that uh, has a lack, a lack of understanding of what really climate change is doing. Um, you know, if it rains, uh, constantly, and then you have floods, and you know uh, crops are destroyed, or whether you don't have any rains, and and crops are destroyed. Uh, people don't really see this as climate change, but they see this as a a probably a curse, or uh, they see this uh, potentially as a uh, season that um, uh, they believe that uh, is just created because there's more of um, uh, a drier season than uh, having more rain. So our people lack the understanding of what's really happening with climate change. And I think uh, as PNG Green's party progresses uh, forward, I think that's our biggest challenge is to create that a, a vehicle uh, that we can be able to drive the awareness at the district, at the province, at the village level, at the community level, just building a constant awareness of what's really happening around the world and how they have been affected by those uh, changes that are happening around the world. And I think if uh, we understand firstly is that first we must appreciate that PNG is a, is a green planet. Uh, uh, and, and, and because we are a green continent, um, uh, uh, our people don't really appreciate what we have because basically, you know, you just walk out the, uh, your house and there's trees growing in front of you. You have a, a green lawn, you know, you appreciate everything that is around you. Uh, to some degree, but I think the, the fact that it's there, you don't really, really, truly appreciate uh, what we have. 
And I think because we don't truly appreciate what we have, it's very easy for us to uh, engage with investors that want to come and cut our trees and, uh, you know, come in and destroy our flora and fauna and destroy our oceans because of that lack of awareness or lack of knowledge of the impacts of climate change. And I think over the next uh, year or so, I think uh, PNG Greens Party under my leadership will be looking at uh, creating the, the vehicle that we might try to push. And I think one way that we can do it is to engage ourselves with university students that um, uh, we have uh, five or six universities here in Papua New Guinea that we can connect with. So we will have to create an, an opportunity to go and visit those schools, talk to them about the importance of uh, of uh, protecting our, our our planet or protecting our, our continent, or protecting uh, Papua New Guinea as a uh, frontier of uh, as a green um, uh, green continent, and and build that awareness in our communities and make sure that our people are aware of what they actually have, and the fact that we 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 have a, a, a green continent, um, our people can be aware of what they have. Uh, not necessarily always going to be a monetary term attached to it, but the fact that we can be able to protect the species, protect the the animals, protect the flora, fauna, you know, protect the environment, so that they take custody of it and they take ownership of of what they have and then they protect it. But the only way to do that, uh, Nick, is to really, really, really start from the bottom by building awareness uh, with our people and making them aware of what what they actually have, you know, what the resource they have that's a major contributing oxygen um, pump to the rest of the world. So I think once they start understanding that and start saying that, yep, I think I, I, I am contributing in a bigger way to the to the uh, oxygen to the world. And then I think when they start understanding that, not, not only that, but appreciate what they have in the sense that they've got, you know, uh, uh, insects, they've got uh, uh, animals that uh, they are nowhere around the world, they will take pride and start protecting those things. But in order for us to get to that stage, Nick, is that I think uh, awareness would be the key for my people to encourage them and open them up to understanding what what they actually have that's a blessing uh, rather than seeing as a monetary term in, in many cases, which is what we discuss quite often. Hmm. I'm interested in hearing about that because I know in um, in different countries around the world in recent elections, there have been... Uh, experiments that green parties have been doing about how they talk about issues like climate change or deforestation yeah. or all of this. Um, uh, for example, in the recent Australian elections, there was a focus in the campaign to connect climate change to material concerns. So not just about the, um, the importance of reducing carbon emissions to reduce the greenhouse effect, but also because by taking this investment path in clean energy and all of this sort of thing, it will reduce people's electricity bills and make communities more self-sufficient and self-reliant. And like you were saying, uh, not have as great an impact on um, crop cycles and, and rain cycles. There won't be as much drought. There won't be as much flood. The weather will be more predictable over the longer term which really matters to people in rural communities and people in the cities as well, if they think about it for a bit. Yeah. Uh, so what were, I'm interested to know some of the stories you heard during the campaign about the, the issues that people faced and what, what they wanted changed. Um, because obviously as the representative for those communities, it's, it's your responsibility to, to take those issues to parliament uh, and to make change. Were there any key messages that the communities were telling you that they wanted you to act on? Yeah, um, the, uh, firstly, let me put it this way. Um, when I came, when I won the seat in 2017, I won the seat as the member for Ichibitari uh, Open uh, Electorate. And um, uh, in this, in that time of parliament, our 10th parliament, uh, we were able to get my district to be split uh, into two districts. So we had uh, Ijivitari uh, Open Electorate and we had a new uh, district which was called the Popuneta Open Electorate. So I decided to run for the new uh, the new open seat, the new electorate, so which is Popuneta Open. So um, this particular electorate is more inland. Uh, most of the, I would say, 90% of the voting population are inland, connected more to the land. Uh, Ijivitari, on the other hand, uh, has probably 50% of uh, 
coastal communities and 50% of um, uh, inland communities. So obviously, in, when it comes to uh, climate change, the coastal communities, uh, uh, the 50% of the uh, coastal communities that are in Egyptaria are quite affected by climate change, mostly. Um, the villages along the, the corridor towards the, the bottom part or the tip of uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, you find that uh, generally um, uh, the sea levels are increasing and obviously most of the villages that were along the coastline have now moved inland uh, because the sea is, is encroaching into the into the land. So they are, they are more so the people that they would have a lot of questions, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, election campaigns, is that what would you do if you were a member? And those were some of the questions that we were asked. So we, we, we our, our focus and our plan uh, in 2017, but unfortunately, because it was one of the largest districts in the country, um, the resources was quite was quite spread. So obviously, we couldn't do everything that we wanted to do in the five years. But obviously, we had a 15-year plan was to continue to address some of these issues. But I hope that uh, the new member that's been elected for Ijivitari can be able to take on some of those uh, key uh, points that we had discussions with our people. But for us on the inland, of course, uh, uh, some of the areas that are obviously affected is more of the dry season. So obviously um, there are issues that get raised. And one of the concerns that the community raised was that the lack of support when it came to dry season. Um, so the discussion with them was that uh, if we can find um, uh, plans that uh, could uh, adapt to Hasha, Hasha environment and 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 uh, grow those uh, plants to see whether they, that can support their livelihood or their daily uh, survival. And uh, those were the discussions we've had. And of course, over the next uh, few months, we will, we will be having discussions with uh, uh, the National uh, uh, Agricultural Research Institute to find out ways how we can be able to pick some of those scientific um, uh, findings that they've got on, on finding um, uh, plants that are not affected by climate change that we can be able to then uh, pass those onto our rural communities to be able to grow those particular plants that can be able to deal with those Hasha environment that comes through. Um, uh, in 2000 and um, um, I think it was 2000 and, uh, 2002, I think, or 2003, if my memory uh, been, uh, um, brings to clear the, the incident that happened in Oro. I think we had a, a cyclone Guba that hit, hit our, our province that affected many of our people. And of course, a lot of people came out uh, suffering from that particular destruction. But um, our people are resilient people and they, they learn to adapt and grow quickly. So for us, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's finding out how best we can be able to support our rural communities, particularly the fact that 90% of our people are rural based. So it's finding uh, climate uh, adapted type of uh, uh, crops that we can be able to pass on to them, that they can be able to, to grow and, and, and support their livelihoods. For for me as a as a member of parliament, my my job is obviously is to continue to educate my people, uh, continue to uh, uh, create an avenue uh, for them to be able to uh, upskill their children or train their children or bring the the level of their education up. Because the more people that we can have educated in our society, I think that uh, uh, level of educating our people would grow. And in turn, we would then be able to ensure that our people are better prepared for climate changes that are affecting the rest of the world. So, uh, Nick, for us, I think uh, uh, questions that were asked were more so to do with how would we be able to react if there was a, a drought that uh, would affect our inland communities. So, our our approach is that well, we would look at engaging with a. Uh, 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 the National um, Agricultural Research Institute to see how best we can be able to support them through a means of providing them uh, adaptable uh, crops that can be able to grow through harsher conditions or environment that can also ensure that they continue to survive on their land. Mm -hmm. We have a number of green parties across uh, Asia and, uh, and the Pacific. Is there any advice or lessons you have for Green Parties in our region based on your time in Parliament so far or from the campaign you ran in July? Yeah, um, for me personally, it's one of the things that I see that lacks is the lack of uh, communication or lack of interaction between um, Green Parties around the world. 
I mean, when I became, uh, when I started um, initially having discussions with um, the, the party executives, um, uh, one of the things that I found out was that there was no lack of support. Uh, there was no information provided to to the to the party. There was no interactions uh, between our closest neighbours, uh, like the Asia Australia Greens Party. I mean, they do talk uh, from once in a year or once every two years. But for me, that is that's not enough. If we want uh, to have a global impact as a party, as a group, or as an entity. Um, I believe there needs to be more communication. I think we need to really engage with other green parties around the world and have a, a, a one common voice and one common goal. And we all drive that uh, uh, in our provinces, in our country. And then we share the same sentiments across. I mean, we'll all have different policies. I think most policies uh, are copy paste, uh, but there's no particular policy, I believe, that's tailored specifically for a particular area. So by engaging with other Greens Party around the world, I think we can be able to create uh, you know, those different policy frameworks uh, for, for Greens Party around the world so that when, when, we, when we, you know, we should have a, uh, uh, an event where we all get all the Greens Party around the world together in one particular area and echo our voices on, on, on issues that are affecting the, um, the globe but you you mentioned something uh, about uh, you know uh, australia campaigning on a particular platform uh, for greens party and, and and i'm excited to hear what they're doing in australia now where they're starting to focus on clean energy and i, I believe they're looking towards um, um both solar and um a turbine with uh, fans or wind you know those windmills to, to generate power. And it's exciting that Australia is now taking that path. And I, must, I think Papua New Guinea, because we are such a close neighbor to Australia, uh, that we, we tend to um, uh, uh, sort of follow in their similar path that they take. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Australia starts talking to us on how best we can be able to capture uh, some of the clean energy in, in our country to be able to harness what we have and then produce cleaner power for our people. And I think once we do that, I think we can be able to become not only a green planet, a green planet, a green continent, but we can be able to be one of the lead, leaders in the in the developing countries, you know, in terms of uh, uh, promoting um, uh, clean um, and green energy in Papua Guinea. Absolutely. And you um, you mentioned the need for Greens from around the world to come together and uh, and have those conversations. I hope we can uh, see you next year at the Global Greens uh, Congress in, in South Korea. Um, we're looking forward to that in the in the middle of next year. So there will be more information shared about that soon. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm excited. I, I was briefed by Andrew about it. Uh... Few days ago about that possibility. So um, of, of course uh, uh, we will we've uh, uh, set in a plan in motion to uh, raise some funds for that, so that we can come and attend that uh, Greens Party conference in 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 Korea, uh, and then hopefully uh, we can also learn what they what 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 they're doing in their countries, and hopefully they can learn from what uh, we are doing in our countries, and hopefully we can bring those learning back to Papua New Guinea and be able to implement some of those. Uh, over a uh, period of time here, so that that. Way. But like I said, um, Nick, I think for us importantly is to is to build awareness around the fact what uh, the if effects and impacts of climate change is having on our people. Mm. So, Richard, until uh, the last couple of years, you were a member of the Our Development Party, correct? Um, could you tell me That's why right. you chose to leave that party and why uh, you decided to join the Greens? Yeah, um, look, I, I firstly, the party uh, decided to move to the opposition. And I had different views about the idea of being in opposition, and particularly Papua New Guinea. Uh, our politics is, is quite uh, controlled by the side you take whether you be in opposition or you be in government. So for me, it was it, it was no brainer that I needed to remain in government uh, in terms of ensuring that I continue to start the work that we, we started in 2017, uh, delivering basic services to our people. And we wanted to carry that for the, for the entire five years. So for me, it was not a rocket science to decide where to stay. Uh, and um, yeah, by moving to government, obviously, there was the option to join the ruling party. 
directly. But um, when I was approached, and we've had these discussions with uh, PNG Greens Party prior to me uh, leaving our development party, was that we had discussions on on on, on whether I should be able to uh, join PNG Greens Party and be their voice on the floor of parliament about global climate issues. And of course, the, the fact that uh, industrialization is uh, impacting uh, on our people and our land and our resources. So uh, obviously that uh, kind of gave me the uh, strong uh, drive to be able to join PNG Greens Party. So of course, uh, it was a difficult decision, um, Nick, to, to join um, PNG Greens Party, particularly because it did not have any members of parliament. And of course, uh, with it came a lot of responsibility in terms of uh, strengthening the uh, finance of the party, uh, bringing about reforms to the party to ensure that the party had, uh, we, we collectively agreed on uh, on what we stood for and what we represented. And the fact that uh, the idea was that, or the objective was that we must influence the younger generations to be part of PNG Greens party. So when the party executive sort of uh, said that, look, member, uh, we are keen to work with you to develop some of these uh, uh, points that you raised uh, that also then gave me the peace and gave me the willingness to be able to team up with PNG Greens Party and, and lead PNG Greens Party to the elections in, uh, in, 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 in 2022. So the outcome was not what we expected, but obviously, like I said, uh, there needs to be a lot of awareness uh, before I think PNG Greens Party can produce more than one uh, member of parliament. So the July election results mean that James Marape from the Pangu party is uh, once again the country's prime minister. Uh, you've known Mr Marape for some time. Can you tell me about your relationship with him and what sort of government you expect him to lead? Well, the, the our prime minister of our country uh, is, is pretty much the, in the same uh, um, age bracket as I am. So we kind of synergize with our ideas very very well you know um he's a he's a, he's a young leader in the country that uh, is very passionate about um uh, making sure that um, uh, we do not leave any child behind uh, our resources are protected um, our people are the, the biggest beneficiary of it and we share very similar um, ideas and very similar a policy framework as to what we would like to see PNG uh, progress, particularly when in the in uh, in the next two years or just before, almost less than three years before PNG uh, reaches um, 50 years of independence. So obviously the work now is to make sure that uh, we progress Papua New Guinea uh, a little further in terms of uh, development and progress is to move it a, a lot more uh, 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 maybe take two steps rather than one step forward. Um, I've known uh, an, uh, Prime Minister when I came into politics. So um, uh, in terms of relationship, I've had a five-year relationship with him. And obviously one of that was uh, when um, he became the Prime Minister, uh, he invited me to be his Vice Minister on Foreign Investment. So my role was to basically provide him um, uh, advice in, in a sense that if there was an investor that was coming into the country, obviously my job was to make sure that uh, uh, we um, investigated uh, that investor uh, that was coming in, um, what background did they have, uh, what quality did they bring into the country, what what interest did they have, you know, where, where would they want to see PNG in the next 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years for that matter. So obviously that advice uh, uh, would, would, uh, would then make give the prime minister the opportunity to decide uh, whether that invest investment was good for the country. But obviously my job also entailed me to, uh, because you, my my job as the, or the vice minister crisscross into different ministries. So I would of course have to uh, engage with the minister for foreign affairs. I would have to engage with the minister for commerce and industry. I'd have to uh, engage with the minister for planning, minister for finance, minister for treasury, you know, constantly engaging with, uh, uh, key economic ministers like Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, Tourism, on how best we can be able to um, uh, progress PNG in terms of investment. So that sort of relationship kind of like was, uh, was sort of more or less cemented uh, in that path. So obviously going to the election as the leader for PNG Greens Party, I, I made a commitment to support Prime Minister that uh, when we both uh, were re-elected back in, in 2022, that I would give him my support uh, uh, to continue as the prime minister and obviously um, 
uh, that undertaking was kept. Uh, when when I was declared, I moved straight to his camp to give him the support that he remains as the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. So we have a, a, a reasonable relationship, a good relationship, I would say. Um, uh, but as the Prime Minister of the country, he's, he's uh, always um, he's, 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 he's spread out in terms of his commitment to supporting all the 118 members of parliament. So obviously, when I get a chance to, or every now and then, I, I do engage with him, and, and we have some really good discussions on where we want to progress Papua New Guinea over the next five years. Great. And on that, what are your big priorities for the next five years? What are the what are the main things that you want to achieve? Well, two things we campaigned on in 2017. Uh, one was to uh, focus completely on education. Um, uh, what we wanted to do is uh, develop our human resource, um, get them ready uh, for the next 10, 15 years. And then, of course, the other one was to concentrate on um, agriculture, to empower our people in the rural communities to be able to, to move from um, domestic agriculture to potentially uh, supplying food for the country and where the opportunity would present itself to look at the international market. So those are the key two things we will focus on over these next five years is to develop those two particular areas. But that's at the district level. But obviously, being the leader of PNG Greens Party, obviously, we'll have to look at uh, particular things like uh, how can we best uh, uh, look at uh, conservation, uh, pres preservation, uh, look at how best we can be able to protect our resources, protect our land, protect our culture, protect our people, protect our forests, protect our fish, protect our uh, oceans. You know, those are going to be ongoing um, uh, matters that we will continue to speak about and continue to educate our people. And as we continue to grow, then obviously uh, we can find, um, uh, you know, uh, how we can be able to capture commercialization and uh, finding a, a, a green community and try and synergize that and see how best we can be able to catch fish and export it or how we can be able to farm fish and export it or how can, how can we be able to, uh, you know, rather than uh, if we're going to cut trees, how far? if we're going to cut a tree, how many trees do we plant in its place? So these are things that we are going to have to work with over the next five years to make sure that our people uh, not only participate and engage in, um, in, in progressive and development uh, aspirations, but also at the same time to ensure that our land, our people and our resources are protected as, as much as we can protect them. Right. Um, you've been very generous of your, uh, with your time. Uh, I have two more questions if we have time for it. The first yeah. is if you have one message for the people of Papua New Guinea and for Greens around the world, what would it be? Uh, for Papua New Guinea is protect your land, protect your culture, uh, protect your resources because uh, they're your future. Uh, for our Greens Party friends around the world is that let's work together. I think we have a global crisis and I think developed nations uh, must stop instructing developing nations, but rather listen to developing nations on what needs to happen to protect our resources and our land. You know, I think Papua New Guinea being one of the last uh, green uh, planet, uh, I would say continent, and not only that, we are part of a family of the blue continent. You know, we share the Pacific Ocean with a lot of the Pacific countries, which are also heavily impacted by climate changes that I think the, the developed nations must start listening to our smaller nations. And rather than them telling us, is we telling them uh, what needs to happen to protect our land because uh, these are small nations and, uh, you know, if greed if industrialization and commercialization is the way the world wants to go, then many of our smaller nations, uh, we're gonna be struggling and will be the biggest impact uh, from uh, the um, climate change that is affecting the world today. Right, and one last question that we ask all of our guests, uh, why do you do this work? Uh, work as a politician? Yep. <laughs> well, well, Nick, I guess uh, someone once said to me that if you if you if you want to change the world, uh, you you go to a place where you can change it. And I think uh, for me, uh, the best place that I can be able to have an influence, uh, the best place I believe that I can be able to um, make decisions that affect my country, affect my people, is to be at that level as a politician. 
Um, I've worked in a number of different areas uh, in the corporate organizations. I've worked uh, for Coca-Cola. Uh, I've worked for Toyota, you know, and these are uh, uh, industries that are leaders in the world. You know, so I've, I've brought in a lot of that culture, discipline, corporate discipline, um, time management discipline, um, uh, prudent uh, financial mm -hmm. discipline, and I've brought that back into uh, into politics. And I've, I'm, I'm always constantly pushing myself to make sure that I'm on time for everything. I try my best to to do all those little things, get them right. And I've, I've always been the, uh, the strong believer. And uh, it's a metaphor that I've always sort of built my my leadership on is that um, that it it is impossible to swallow an elephant, uh, but uh, if you eat it bit by bit, you're certainly able to complete it. So Nick, I think if we just do little things, get them, not just do little things, but do the little things right all the time, I think we will progressively change uh, our country and make it a better country to live in. And you know, the globe is at one stage was was we were all divided. Now we're one big family. And I think the, the, the responsibility rests on, rests on all the leaders, uh, whether it be political or whether it be um, um, uh, in in the corporate environment, leading greater industries, mining industries. That uh, uh, we need to look at best ways for mining. I mean, we let's look at uh, 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 a, a green way of uh, green uh, or way of mining, you know, should we be dumping our waste in the ocean? So well, let's look at ways we can make uh, those industries that are progressing, but do it in a, in a more uh, uh, environmental friendly way so that our people, simple people that live in villages are not affected by the growing um, grid of industry, industrialization and commercialization. Mr. Messeri, thank you so that much for your all time your today. I think I have many more, but I, I don't want to take any more of your time. Uh, from all of us no at the worries. Asian Pacific Greens Federation uh, and from the Green Parties around the world, um, we wish you all the best uh, and good luck in this next term of Parliament. Yeah, thank you, Nick. And uh, thank you to uh, the, the Greens family that uh, would be watching this program. I appreciate the time. And I, I look forward to meeting up with some of the leaders soon so we can uh, discuss some of these important issues that's affecting everyone of us.